Thank you, Marty. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just start out by saying I hope everybody's well and in good health and their semester is going well. Um, uh, as Marty introduced uh, Aquia and myself, um, uh, we are going to be presenting today on uh, this PEARLS program, an NSF uh, funded program. And when we think about this title, PEARLS, um, as some of you may be aware that um, funding agencies want these uh, nifty acronyms, but I thought of it more of a sense of, okay, how can we tie this to this geoscience directorate that we're actually applying to? And so um, we came up with this acronym um, using the term PEARLS, thinking of you know, a mineral um, dealing with soils. And so uh, providing educational access to research and learning in geosciences is what we came up with. So today we're just going to take a few minutes of your time to give an introduction of the program, um, some of the objectives, um, how you may be able to help us um, uh, make this program come to fruition and sustainable, and um, just what we're uh, aspiring to do with this program. So we will first uh, go ahead and I'll um, pass it over to Aquia. Yes, so we thought uh, what we wanted to do is start off with something interactive. Uh, so we hope that you all engage in this. And so during this time, we wanted to open up uh, kind of like an icebreaker question and see who's in the room. So the question is, what type of scientist are you? So to answer this question, uh, please use your browser or your smartphone and go to uh, menti.com. Um, and we can see what your responses are. So what type of scientist are you? So take the next 30 seconds or so to, to submit your answers and we can see them pop up on the screen. So yes, this is an s &T, So we have some botany, soil science. Oh, there's some engineers in the, in the midst, a community ecologist, microbiologists, evolutionary ecologists. Great, we've seen some good answers. Agronomy, okay. So it's quite an eclectic room. Water resources management, ecological engineer. All right, wonderful. We also have a second question. Oh. So what we'll uh, do first here is we'll just uh, based on uh, what we presented in um, this uh, proposal was how we define geoscience. So uh, what we saw in the survey um, was soil science, some engineering, some microbiology, and those are all different fields within science or STEM, Well, because I did see a couple of engineering. But for this particular program, we had to define um, geoscientists. So traditionally, we look at um, uh, branches of geology. And so that includes these natural resources, mineralogy, uh, geomorphology, as you can see in this description, hydrogeology. So if we take these branches of geology and we kind of couple them with branches of earth science, and in earth science, we kind of define those as air, life, land, and water. And so if we take these two and kind of mesh them together, then we have this term geoscientist. Now I know um, most people wouldn't use that term um, often um, because their discipline is very to a specific type of work. But um, for this type of funding and who we would like to recruit, we wanted this to be a very broad um, definition. So um, what we would like to do is recruit students who are non-traditional geoscientists. So um, if you think of yourself in either geology plus earth science kind of mesh 
together, we would consider you a traditional geoscientist. But those non-traditional geoscientists are those who may be in just chemistry or just engineering or just physics. And so we would like to have um, students who may be in those fields who have a strong interest in geoscience work or environmental science work to kind of come on over to the geoscience side. Um, and we'll explain a little bit more why. And so that leads us to our next question in the survey now that we've defined um, how we um, term geoscientists. Can you go back to, oops, you can go back to the menti.com. And then in this case, um, the question, if I can get this to. The question is, are you a geoscientist? The question is, are you a geoscientist? So now it's advancing my slides instead of going back to my mentee. My apologies here. It worked previously. So this is something, am I a geoscientist? I flip flop in this question all the time. So it's interesting to see what this crowd says, who they are. So here you would still uh, use the code again and um, you would put in your answer, are you a geoscientist? <laughs> and as you can see, the numbers are fluctuating here. So we'll give people a few more seconds to put in their answers. I love how this is fluctuating in real time. <laughs> yeah. So that's um, more than half of our participants um, on the Zoom call today. So this just gives us an idea that um, based on our definition, um, quite a few of you consider yourselves to be geoscientists. And so that um, leads to our next slide, um, the importance of this type of work. Right, and so when we think about geoscientists and who is in the geoscientific workforce, we can do a, a quick Google search. And these are the images that kind of come up about geoscientists and who they are. Um, and you can see from these pictures, people are always outdoors, it's rugged, um, it's field work driven, um, but there's also other images of geoscientists that we should also consider. Next. So that brings us to the, the team here that uh, we have Aquia, myself, and Dr. Ebony Terrell Shockley. So uh, Dr. Terrell Shockley was unable to uh, join us today, but um, uh, what we'd like to do here is to just basically state that we don't necessarily look like traditional geoscientists, right? Um, and even my own thought, I'm thinking people who may be outdoors, um, at field sites when I think of a geoscientist. But um, we all have very different pathways to um, get to this career. And so here we would just like to just give one example of how um, Aquia and I reached our uh, geoscience field. And what I'd like to emphasize here is that um, the literature is telling us that experiences that students have can either enhance or negate their thoughts and processes about how they pursue geoscience. And so what we would like to do in introducing this program is not only reach those students who are underrepresented and underdeserved, but also give them a face um, that may be reflective of themselves. And so that lets them know, um, one, that they too can be a geoscientist and um, two, that there are many pathways to get to the process. And so um, my one example was um, interning at EPA right after I finished my undergrad. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I had a biology degree, wasn't sure I wanted to go into bi biology research or work and interned at EPA under an environmental chemist. Um, looking at drinking water disinfection byproducts. And that led and fueled my 
interest and love for environmental science, geoscience work. And in my case, uh, all my degrees are chemical engineering. So I start off as a chemical engineer. And then when I went into graduate school, um, I, my main goal was to somehow get into education and I thought a PhD would help. Uh, but the one piece of advice that I was given was to consider uh, not just the project, but also my advisor, my future advisor who I would select and make sure that I would get along with my future advisor. And my future advisor at the time was chemical engineering and earth and atmospheric sciences. So that's how I ended up in the field that I was. But another reason is because my first year uh, college roommate, she was actually an earth and atmospheric sciences major. And I noticed that in her major, she got to explore, they went to field camps, uh, she got to see a satellite in Chile and did some amazing things during her undergraduate tenure. So for that, I had some experience um, realizing that there's different uh, pathways in STEM that can lead to exciting fields. And although uh, Dr. Terrell Shockley wasn't able to join us today, her background is in science education. And so she's in the, she's currently in um, UMD School of Education and uh, a large component of her work deals with teaching um, students how to be science educators. And that's what kind of fueled her love and interest in um, uh, geoscience and science, generally speaking, as her um, degree state, she has an undergrad in biology. So <clears throat> here we'd like to just get a feel once again, um, how did you get into your field of geoscience since the majority of you kind of consider yourselves a geoscientist? So here, um, the literature is stating, as I said before, experiences usually drive and fuel that love for this type of work for students in subsequent years and you know, in, in what they decide to do in the future. So for some, it could be just a home experience. Maybe you had, um, uh, you lived on a farm or your grandparents owned a farm or you had parents who did a lot of gardening. Maybe that put that bug in you to do something related to uh, geoscience work. Or it could um, have been one experiment in your K through 12 experience. Um, maybe you were that student that said, okay, um, doing this volcano, <laughs> the volcano eruption experiment that you do in grade school was like the best thing ever. Um, and maybe that's what sparked your interest in geoscience. Or you could have been someone who um, learned about geoscience on the, um, on the job. Did you help? build a Habitat for Humanity house? Or did you have a summer experience that um, a piece of geoscience was introduced to that? And that could be how you said, yep, this is the field I wanna go in in the future. Or did you come to college and think you were going to pursue one type of training and you took one um, gen ed science requirement class and said, yep, that's exactly what I wanna do for the rest of my life. <laughs> so if you could, um, please just share um, how you got into the field, whether it was a home experience, on the job, uh, grade school or K through 12, or a higher ed experience, and, um, and just drop it in the chat. And Aquia will kind of um, walk us through what all the different answers are, so we can just kind of get a feel of um, how you chose geoscience. Yeah, we're getting a, a few responses uh, coming in. Um, and so there's one response that talks about early childhood and teenage experiences um, with twisting and turning as an undergrad and grad students searching for my perfect career. So it took some time to really, you know, find a home, uh, let's say on the geoscience path. Um, I see someone else said, uh, their mother was a wetland ecologist for the EPA. That's, That's amazing. <laughs> so definitely uh, home experience had a, a big role there. Um, and then scouting also, I just read that, it keeps on moving, I'm sorry. Uh, so summer job as an undergraduate, somebody said scouting, uh, which is interesting. I just enrolled my five-year-old in Cub Scouts 
So uh, hopefully he will get interested in geoscience too. Um, so yeah, a lot of great responses. Um, and then, but it wasn't really until soil judging and I wanted to become a soil science major. Interesting, so judging and being interactive. Um, someone said, I wanted to study plants and then realized half of the biomass is below ground. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, another person, biology, chemistry, BS, and then first postgraduate job in soil science department. So again, uh, a transition from uh, biology sciences, chemistry sciences, uh, to now geoscience postgraduate. Ah, another home experience, my mother loved wildflowers, something very simple, but very impactful uh, that occurs. So yes, thank you all for sharing. I don't think I was able to read all of them, but um, please take the time to read and look at everybody's and you will see that um, it's just these small, um, seemingly small experiences that have really large impacts on everybody's uh, future careers. Okay. So we talked about the motivations, the experiential motivations, but it's also important to realize that uh, geoscience work um, is employable. <laughs> um, when I said I wanted to become an atmospheric scientist for my PhD, my family was like, what? What are you gonna do with that? Uh, what are you gonna do with clouds? Um, but the reality is the geoscience work is growing and it is employable. So if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, the median pay in 2019 was about $92,000 per year. And the typical entry level education is a bachelor's degree. That is, you do not need uh, this postdoc to get a job in the geoscience field. What's really interesting is if we look at the outlook for geoscience, and that is on average, it's growing 5%. That is, in 2029, there will be 1,600 additional jobs in the geoscience field. So this is faster than average. So if you compare that to all the other types of work that's available, uh, geoscience is a growing field and um, is looking to employ uh, new people. And you can find these uh, data sets at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Next. And so we need to talk about why there is a need to increase the geoscience workforce. And part of the answer to that question, we need to look at the US population, um, in particular, the age demographics. And so we see, if we look at the US population in 2015, there's these uh, large uh, sections that are highlighted in yellow. And those really represent the baby boomers and the millennials, which make large fractions of the US population. But we also know that baby boomers are actually a large fraction of the current workforce. And as we approach uh, the 2020s, uh, we see that baby boomers are actually heading more into retirement. Um, and so they are leaving the workforce in larger numbers. Next. Oops. So that leads to this next slide um, of asking the question, why is there a need to increase the geoscience workforce? And as Aquia mentioned, we have um, those at age 65 um, reaching retirement. And according to the data, about 27% of the geoscience workforce is that baby boomer um, group. And so we're, we can um, possibly lose 27% of the geoscience workforce by 2029. But if you take a look here at this um, graph to the right, we currently have about 327,000 um, geoscientists and possibly adding um, a little over 25,000 to the workforce. But if you subtract that 27% of those baby boomers, that accounts for almost um, 88, a little over 88,000 of this talent deficient that's in the green. So if you have a deficiency of 130,000 and 88,000 of them are baby boomers, that's a significant um, number generally speaking. 
So this is one, this kind of answers the question, why is there a need to increase the geoscience workforce? We need to replenish our numbers. We need more people out there looking at um, uh, climate change, looking at the ice caps melting, looking at um, changes in animal populations in different regions. We need people out there doing this type of work. But um, I don't want to necessarily just focus on the fact that they're retiring. I think another component that's even um, just as important with uh, the retire, in addition to the retirement of baby boomers, is the loss of knowledge transfer, right? So what we're talking about here is, um, yes, you have a large number that may be um, leaving due to retirement, but they're taking all that knowledge from 20, 30, 40 years with them. We don't wanna lose that. <laughs> um, in academia, we're very fortunate because a lot of our emeritus faculty still do um, um, some work and they still contribute some either as, as um, co-authors on papers or still work on small projects. So they may be retired, but they're still contributing some. But what about those who are in industries or who are in government jobs? They retire, they're gone, um, they're on the porch drinking a cold one, right? And so now we're thinking, where is all of that knowledge? So this is another reason and, and part of the motivation to increase um, our numbers into the geoscience workforce. So then um, now that we've kind of discussed why we need to increase our numbers, well, who are we talking about? Um, we also need to diversify our geoscience workforce. So this graph on the left basically tells us that of um, all the occupations, you can see here in the yellow color, environmental scientists and geoscientists are at the bottom of those that are total employed when you're talking about underrepresented minorities. But even within that group, um, minorities are 15 to 25% lower, as you can kind of see in this graph. So um, we're kind of facing two uphill battles, but we need to um, diversify the workforce because um, as you can see on the right, oops, apologies, um, 50, between 2010 and 2019, uh, women made up 50% of the population. And so, um, from this data, approximately 44% um, of those women are getting uh, geoscience, 44% um, and encompass geoscience careers and 46% um, um, of those being uh, women in geosciences. And so when we look at Hispanics as well, um, they're our largest minority population right now, followed by Blacks, African-Americans, Asians and American Indians. So um, uh, to add to this diversity, we also have to be cognizant that between 2010 and 2019 of the geoscience um, degrees um, given to Hispanics, the numbers doubled from 6% to 12%. So that tells us right there that um, the Hispanic population is very much interested in uh, geoscience careers. And that's good for us, but we want all uh, minority populations interested in geoscience. And that also includes those with disabilities and also includes veterans, um, not those who are just um, ethnically diverse. So how do we fill this work gap, this geoscience um, workforce gap? And it ultimately just boils down to what we try to propose um, in this um, funding. And that is recruiting as many uh, students as we can to geoscience careers and disciplines. As you can see on the left, 4.9% um, um, is the expected growth percentage um, by the end of 2029. But in this smaller numbers here, you can see environmental science, um, atmospheric and space science, soil and plant sciences. These numbers are uh, much higher. So that kind of gives us an idea that in addition to just geoscience, there are some very specific disciplines where we need more recent graduates. 
And not only does our department have access to that, but what we're trying to do is recruit other departments and um, other units to buy into that as well. So we need these recent graduates and we also need to um, increase the underrepresented minority community in these um, geoscience fields so we can um, get them to the workforce. So uh, what one of the um, uh, objectives that we proposed was in addition to the students completing their undergraduate degrees, what if we were to um, help them get some sort of certification, right? Um, so we know that certifications with, uh, coupled with undergraduate degrees kind of solidify a student's interest and kind of puts a stamp on the fact that they're saying, I'm really interested because I've committed to do this additional training outside of my degree. And so what we know right now, the Association um, uh, Board of Geologists has an exam. And this exam um, is one that you can take and you can do this before you get your work experience. So you'll have this um, certification um, before you have to go and get on the job training. And then you also have this geologist and training certificate that you can also receive. But if we look at this big picture of training, generally speaking for geoscientists and environmental scientists, this is just um, the certificate and licensure are just one piece. We know that students who may go into um, fields may have to do hazwalker training. We also know they may have to do some forms of site assessment training. But if we can provide that um, or provide them access or resources to that through this program, that's what we aim to do. And so this one objective allows us to provide the students with that type of resource and training. Um, another point, as you see at the very bottom, Maryland currently does not provide licensing for professional geologists or geoscientists, but Virginia does. And so this is all more reason to try to um, uh, provide this with students because we know this type of training and certification and licensing occurs in other states. So if we're able to provide that with the students, and as I said, give them um, uh, something else to add to their CV and show their commitment to geoscience, then the likelihood that could increase their chances of getting um, a geoscience career going. And so as you can see here, you have the Board of, Board of Professional Soil Scientists, well Air Professionals, and that's in Virginia. So um, you have access to that. So, so hopefully so far we've convinced you that there is an urgent need for more geoscientists. And so we want to talk a little bit more about the program that we have. And so broadly speaking, geoscientists study the physical aspects of the earth, right? Such as the composition, structure, and processes to learn about the past, present, and future. And so we're defining traditional and non-traditional geoscience work. That is, it spans a lot of these disciplines uh, that use so we can use the tools learned in other disciplines and apply them to geoscience work. For example, uh, when we think about earth science K through 12 educators, they could have a BS degree in education, but uh, teach earth science content. And so it's important that educated uh, students with um, degrees in education also obtain geoscience backgrounds or at least take an introduction to geoscience coursework. Another example is uh, in research nowadays, in geoscience research, whether it be atmospheric, soil science, uh, hydrological sciences, we're gathering a lots of data and it's becoming more and more um, important to be able to analyze that data rapidly um, and correctly. And so we talk about the use of machine learning and um, artificial intelligence in our data sets and our analysis. And so we could incorporate more computer scientists, uh, those who get computer science bachelor's degrees or computer engineering bachelor's degrees to then go on and do postgraduate work in the geosciences. 
Um, so uh, some other non-traditional geoscience work when we think about environmental health and safety, environmental engineering, um, and even positions such as chief sustainability officers uh, who, are, who care about the footprint uh, that companies leave on the earth are also examples of non-traditional uh, geoscience work. And so the way that we want to engage uh, these types of students uh, next is through an introductory course uh, that is AGNR 320. So we have proposed this course, it's currently on the books and we are looking to enroll students right now for spring 2021. It's a one credit seminar course uh, where we have four key goals. One is to learn terminology in the geoscience fields, right? That is if you have never thought about geoscience disciplines, uh, what, what is the terminology that is being used? We also have um, tools to perform hands-on activities for geoscientific measurement, right? Um, we also wanna explain geoscientific connections to the community and policy, such as what we know with environmental justice issues, whether it be air quality, soil um, and land. And then lastly, uh, the key in all type of employment is uh, communication. And so we want to enhance oral and written communication um, to prepare the students for their careers. Next. So uh, since Aquia has um, mentioned what we'd like to uh, do with the introductory course, here we just would like to um, show you the components of the course. So we've divided it into these um, four groups and subsequently the information associated are the learning modules. And so each one of these um, components, environmental, atmospheric, geological, and hydrological will have a learning module associated with it. So for example, in this environmental science module, we may touch on something related to environmental chemistry that could be um, looking at maybe contaminants at a brownfield site, or um, it could look at like um, some of the PFAS contamination at Fort Meade um, and, and see how that type of environmental chemistry um, can then be coupled to the environmental justice aspect, right? And so each one of these modules will have this small component of we're doing this type of geoscience work, but how does it relate back to the people that it affects? Not only just um, them directly, but your human health, um, the land health, and the subsequent um, things that it's affecting. And so one example also could be um, the Greenhouse Mercury Project, something that I've been working on um, through phyto screening, looking at mercury um, uptake in select plants to remove that from um, pieces of um, aspects of the Chesapeake Bay and how it affects Chesapeake Bay, basically metal uptake. And uh, for atmospheric science, which is a module that I'll be leading, we really wanna talk about uh, air quality and air quality monitor monitoring, both indoor and outdoor. And so we have some modules looking into ozone concentrations and what leads to higher ground level ozone concentrations and indoor ozone concentrations um, by essentially uh, modifying um, human use. That is, if you replace your carpets and doors, what, how will that change your ozone? Um, or if you just reduce your NOx concentrations that you emit. So we'll be talking a lot more about that in the atmospheric science module. Next. So in the geological science module, um, as we stated, um, we, well, we actually wrote and did this grant pre-COVID, right? So um, <laughs> when we put in these modules and we added under geolo uh, geological science, I said, oh, this would be really cool if we could, I don't know if the, Dr. Tour is on the call, but if we could get students exposed to nutrient management um, work or um, Maryland soil judging excursion. Um, and that would be um, directed towards uh, Marty and Brian. And it's just about exposing them to uh, geoscience work under this module, right? And so um, as Aquia stated, we're introducing them to terminology concepts and this would be 
part of that hands-on, something they could go out and see and see the applications of what this uh, type of work could do. And so that's what um, we were uh, proposing in the geological science module. And lastly, we have hydrological science. And we, this is a really important one, especially as we know climate is changing, we're dealing with water quality and water scarcity is a huge topic. And so um, we'll spend time talking about what are the fundamental water quality measurement analyses like total organic carbon, suspended particles, um, which you need to know if you want to go into this arena and also talk about, also have this project about wastewater treatment and uh, how that works. And so throughout all of these modules, we will definitely have these learning outcomes, which I described previously, um, infused in all these different modules throughout the semester. Next. So this is just one component to our program. Um, really our program is based on a geoscience learning ecosystem model. Um, so we have this introductory geoscience course and we also hope that the students in this program also gain additional certifications uh, through an outside training course. And so those make the technical foundations. Um, and through these technical foundations, uh, students who enroll in the program uh, will also have the opportunity to visit uh, laboratories at agencies, um, government agencies and industrial locations. And we have collaborators um, already for that. Um, and furthermore, um, we have this vertical mentoring structure that they get mentoring from the PIs, but also by visiting uh, these different sites, they also get mentoring at these different agencies and through our collaborators there. And of course, it's an ecosystem, meaning that uh, this vertical mentoring and the, and the visits coupled with uh, the course and the technical foundations, next, is cyclical. Um, they also go to grow uh, the students. Um, so hopefully they obtain self-efficacy and support to continue careers in geoscience. Next. So um, this leads us to the PEARLS application process. And as you can see, it's um, quite simplistic, um, but what we would like to do is um, encourage um, students who may be on the Zoom right now, who have friends who may not be in environmental science and technology, um, encourage them to partake in the course. And if the course is enough to um, keep them interested in geoscience, then apply to the PEARLS um, program. And part of that process is just a two-page letter of interest and personal goals. And then um, we also would like for them to submit a resume just to give us an idea of their course background, what they've done, have they had some internships, um, have they had some experiences that lended to their increased knowledge of geoscience or geoscience careers. Um, and again, we'd like to um, look at students who are juniors and seniors um, in, in their disciplines. And then uh, lastly, uh, a one page that has their ideas for a research project or proposal. Because ideally, um, part of that tiered mentoring is getting a feel of what they'd like to do after they graduate. If um, they're selected to be a part of the program and are able to attend the agency visits, that could be um, their entryway into a geoscience career right after graduation. Or it could be their entryway into um, an internship. So um, if they're interested in that. And then on the other side, if you're interested in going to graduate school, um, that's where we um, can help um, guide the students um, to that direction. So for our first cohort, we have a submission deadline of um, April 28, 2021. And as of right now, um, all of those applications would come directly uh, to me. And so um, if you, what we'd like our audience here to do is um, those who are faculty uh, in collaborations with different departments, um, let them know about the program. Let them know we're looking for um, underrepresented, 
underserved groups and minorities who may have some interest in geoscience and hopefully we can reel them on in to, to stay in the geoscience field. And so um, they'll apply and uh, this is the process we have moving forward. Yeah, and so I think Candace just described that really nicely. Um, this first stage of our program is really information dissemination, trying to get our program out there so more people know about uh, this program here um, at UMD. And so we ask that you help us share this information. Our goal is to reach about 100 students, uh, traditional and non-traditional geoscience majors to really be inclusive. The second step is this introduction to geoscience learning, which we do have on the books. It's currently an introductory course. We hope to transition it to an I-series course uh, to, in future years. Um, and we hope to enroll about 30 students per year. Uh, students who enroll in this course, again, we'll ask them uh, if they have continued interest to submit an application. And uh, with that application in the program, um, if they are selected, uh, we will support and fund any additional certification that they uh, would like to obtain. Um, and we also have funding to send students to workshops and conferences as well as part as as part of uh, building up their technical proficiency. And then lastly, um, we also have site visits which are funded to send students to see uh, geoscience work in action, not just on an academic campus um, in government sites and industrial sites. So this also facilitates workforce network expansion. And so we, so we keep on going around in these cycles for uh, hopefully many years to come. And that's the sustainability of our program in four steps. And so with that, uh, we will actually conclude uh, our discussion and open up uh, the session for any questions that you may have about the CURLS program. Well, very good. Thank you both so much for a very interesting, engaging presentation. And um, Typically, we've asked folks to uh, send questions in on the chat just to have a little bit of uh, order to our chaos and trying to search, search through that. So if anyone has any, um, let's see, and I'm trying to take a look here. Okay, so it looks like Dave, this is um, Dave Tilly, and I can't tell this is a question comment. This is one of the approaches for student professional development that I've had success with is to write, um, is to have them interview folks in the field and write a story about their interviewee's career path or other interesting story that show what their daily duties are like, uh, just as an idea, he says, for your consideration as you're sort of moving forward with pearls. I guess that's a suggestion from Dave about some other things that you might be able to. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Um, Here's a question from Emily Rosso. She says, uh, this sounds like a great program. Not sure if you mentioned this already, but it would be wonderful if interested students could get certified as a nutrient management consultant in Maryland as part of the class. It's definitely a doable, uh, can be done in a semester, she said. So, so Emily works with the Maryland Nutrient Management Program. So I guess she's offering that as a possible suggestion. You wanna to speak to that, Aquia? Oh, I think these are great ideas. Uh, the more programs that we are aware of um, and we can disseminate that information to the students, I think it will really um, bolster the program, right? Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. So just maybe here's a, a question, uh, maybe sort of a clarifying uh, a, a question. So, uh, so most of the folks, it sounds like, uh, maybe not exclusively, but already sort of science oriented somewhere around the way, but sort of more broadly, biolog biology, chemistry, things sort of in the basic science realms, which maybe has sort of a, a broader, uh, you know, exposure to folks than something more specific, which is science. So is, is you're going to, you're offer, going to offer them this great class that sort of gives an overview, you know, ex, you know, various sorts of experiences. Is, is your expectation that, that they, or hope maybe if they're, if they engage that then they would sort of begin to take additional, some additional courses in the geosciences along something that they find interesting and your in, sort of inducements incentives are, you know, support, you know, certification, you know, covering costs for some of these certifications and other opportunities. Is that sort of the, 
so, so how do they balance sort of what they're already doing or as opposed to sort of, you know, sort of moving more into the actually taking geoscience type courses, I guess. Uh, so I, I should mention that the course is geared to juniors and seniors. So we, okay. so we are aware that they're probably uh, very firmly fixed in their undergraduate okay. um, selection majors. But we do want students to consider if two, two routes. One, if you're going to look for employment, consider geoscientific employment. Um, and if so, these trainings that we will fund uh, will help you build your resume into that career, right? Uh, the second is if you're so inclined to continue on to uh, graduate school, uh, maybe you should consider a geoscience major or a geoscience um, field, uh, not just stay within the BS discipline. And so we're also supporting that as well. Was there something you want to add, Candace? No, that, that's exactly what I was thinking as well. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I, from, my, from my own experience, I mean, I, I think in soil science, we, you know, more and more we're getting people who are applying to graduate school in soil science who maybe had just like one course or an introduction or something, but they were studying biology or, you know, uh, you know, botany or something like that. And so they, but they got exposed. And so right. a course like yours and sort of your program would be a good vehicle for right. it's, it's just, those kinds of things. Yeah, it's just trying to give students who, have some interest um, an avenue as to what they could explore because as we said in the presentation um, the numbers are needed and and we want students in the field in the workforce doing this type of work for years and years to come and so what are some ways that we can can draw them in um, and and this is kind of what we came up with and and we got this funded and I think it'd be a, a great way to, like you said, if they've just had one or two courses or had, or took a gen ed class, a science gen ed class, and that sparked their interest, this could just open another avenue of all the other possibilities yeah. by, by them taking the course and then exploring maybe the certification. And, and that's helping them decide um, where they'd like to go next, what they'd like to do next. Yeah. Another suggestion that came in, someone was saying, make, make sure you, you can help uh, get Jonathan, our webmaster, to get a prominent place on our website to help promote the program. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. Great. Well, this is really fantastic. Uh, th thank you both again for taking time to, to talk to us about this. We wish you uh, the very best, and hopefully uh, the folks will continue to uh, reach out to you all with uh, you know their their willingness to help promote things and if they have additional suggestions it sounds like you both are all very uh, open and receptive to additional uh, thoughts and suggestions too so oh yes yes, yes. Th thank you both once again thank uh, you for having us outstanding <laughs> thanks